Make sure you say hi to Michael. Okay, we are in 2 Corinthians 4, 7 through 18 today. We're going to finish our We Are series, uh, thinking through who we are in light of who Jesus is. And the next week, we'll start our Advent series. It is a family Sunday next week. Um, so it will, we'll have a short devotional, but there'll be some family activity around an Advent wreath. So come prepared. And we are asking people to bring uh, Christmas cookies to share. So if you are able, make some Christmas cookies, bring those, and we're going to share those next Sunday. I wanted those for the Christmas party, but they told me no. And so I've made a pastoral decision to just do that on a Sunday. Okay. So if you have the YouVersion Bible app, you can click on events, find Reservoir Church. All the notes in scripture will be there in the app for you, or it'll be on the screen, or you can just listen and hear it. But Chris will read for us and pray, and then we'll dive into it. Hopefully, the Lord will have something for us today. Of course, he will. <laughs> um, this is from 2 Corinthians chapter 4. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you. Since we have the same spirit of faith according to what has been written, I believed and so I spoke, we also believe and so we also speak, knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus, and bring us with you into his presence. For it is all for your sake, so that as grace extends to more and more people, it may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. So we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison, as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. Lord, thank you for the word. We thank you for um, the truth, Lord, in this word. Lord, we thank you for the hope that we find here in this word, Lord, and um, we just pray that you would quiet our hearts and that you would speak through Jonathan as he um, explains this word to us and gives us new insight, Lord, and um, we pray and we, we give you thanks, Lord, for so many things, and we thank you for Jonathan um, just sharing uh, your gospel with us um, today and day uh, Sunday after Sunday for 10 years, Lord. And we, we pray that you would continue to, to bless him and continue to speak through him. And we give you the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Chris. So following Jesus will lead to a life of dying and rising, and that is for our good. Now, if you ask my kids, they will tell you I am in my sourdough phase. And there's a little hint of that, as Iona shared in that video. I go through phases um, of liking different things. And I've taken to making bread this fall, at least. And we're having a little bit of fun with it. And um, you can call me a late adopter, because I know a lot of you made sourdough during COVID, and uh, you had a lot of extra time, so you, you did all that. And, um, but for me, I've realized that doing and taking up this art of combining flour, water, salt, and yeast, it, it, I could not have taken it up any earlier in my life. Because... For those of you who bake bread, no, it is a test of maturity. 
because baking bread slows you down, right? It takes patience. There are long hours of waiting for loaves to rise, and some never do. It takes resilience to keep going when the bake was a disaster this week and you are hesitant to mix it up again the following week. And that's the way of maturity, though, isn't it? When we grow and we're ready for something else, you arrive at a place and become ready for something more. There's time for new responsibility, new experience. And today in our text, I think we encounter in the scripture a life that is so settled in union with Christ that it's reframed essentially in a model of dying and rising. And I think it's a model for us as those following Christ being made to be like him. So we're finishing our short We Are um, uh, sermon series. It's just been a short sermon series for us, uh, thinking through who we are in light of who Jesus is as we finish those I Am statements. We talked about being free from that which enslaved us, free from sin, and we are then now able to cling to truth over irrational fear, so we are fearless in him, driving away anxiety in our day. And then we're formed by the good news of Jesus in community. So we rely on each other to disciple each other and grow in Christ-likeness. And then lastly, at least for this series, we are dying and rising. And I'm sorry, I could not come up with an F word for um, dying and rising. But it's okay, because I think it's good for this idea to stand out against the other. And truth be told, this sermon is not clean, and in fact, in preparation, I decided that I needed another 30 years to figure out this sermon, because I'm on my way. I'm still trying to figure it out myself. I'm far from what Paul is expressing in this letter to the Corinthian church, but against a cultural moment that is essentially proclaiming another Jesus and the one that is proclaimed in scripture and that is proclaiming a different gospel, a gospel that is about winning by taking or subduing the least and rejecting the cross for our own glory and greed. I think we should endeavor all the more to see Jesus clearly and live his way, not our own. And so this is where we share in Christ's life, experience freedom, and then gain a clear view of that which drives our feelings at the deepest sense of who we are. And then we can find the dynamite for formation to be more like him. So it's just a big idea that following Jesus will lead to a life of dying and rising, and that is for our good. Or alternatively, we could say following Jesus will be the death of you, Right? And this is where we call life like it is. We see what keeps us grounded through the highs and lows, and hopefully we embrace the life that is given to us. So just our first idea as we start and as we look at this text, dying and rising with Christ is the normal Christian life. Now, back by popular demand, we have the whiteboard, and it's the small whiteboard because we have to move all of our material every week. But so giving you an image of dying and rising, it's, it's a J um, for Jonathan. Not really. Um, this will make sense. So there's a great book by a guy named Paul Miller who, is, who has written some really phenomenal stuff on prayer. And he has a book actually called Dying and Rising. It's this same idea. But I love Paul because he is not only a minister, he runs an organization called See Jesus, but he's also the father of a child with disability, a nonverbal daughter that speaks through a device where she punches in the letters that she wants to communicate. And so his story is a lot like a number of the families in our church's story. And he talks about dying and rising, and he does that through what he calls the J-curve. Now, our text is a a doozy of a text, right? This is a a pretty big text. And I think sometimes when we preach it, we just kind of glance through it or we make it into a song. You know, we're persecuted, but we're not crushed and all these things. And we're being given over to death for Jesus' sake. And Paul says it's always carrying in the body the death of Jesus. 
So why go to 2 Corinthians for this idea of dying and rising? Because we could have gone several other places in the New Testament, I think, to get that same idea. Because Jesus calls us to this. Paul certainly talks about it. Peter will invite the disciples to this. The posture here, though, is Paul's regular M.O., and I think it's certainly towards the tail end of his life. He gives us great picture and model of this life. But here, I think he certainly paints the paradox of not just his ministry, but what all of the Christian life should look like in maturity. Now, the context, I think, is helpful for our story as well, because Paul is writing to the church to commend, essentially, the repentance of a sinner that is among them, and he's calling the church to forgive him and invite him back into the body of believers. He's reminding them of their participation, not just in their own church body and their community, but in the advance of the gospel broader beyond their city. And that they are ambassadors of Christ, members of the global church, and he is warning them against these super apostles that have come among them that are selling another gospel. These are the influencers, the crowd-pleasing ministers that have these really flashy ministries that people love, promoting a gospel of self-satisfaction that are manipulating people for gain essentially for power in their day. And they're preaching a theology of glory, of human glory, versus a theology of the cross. And so it's in this context that Paul reveals dying and rising. And, and Paul's story is essentially every believer's story, right? We met Jesus. This is a treasure that's put into jars of clay, and we are these jars of clay, vessel, vessels for everyday use, not seen as valuable or really all that strong. If Paul was writing this letter today in Southern California, he may have said, we have this treasure in in and out fry trays to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. He says, we are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed. The key words in that whole section is, but not. And we get that life is hard. After all, we all live it. And we might not always describe it with such weight, but we don't just leave it as a mere fact of life. One writer says that suffering, pain, trials, difficulty, death, disappointment, all of these are normal for humanity and they are despised generally by humanity. But as Christians, we are called to see God's work in us through these means and to understand his purpose to humble and unite us and to draw us closer to our great and glorious Savior. As Paul says, it always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. And this is then the J curve. This is what our life looks like. Just like the letter J, Jesus' life descends through his incarnation, then to death, and then upward in his resurrection and exaltation. And all of Apostle Paul's descriptions of the gospel in some way trace that same pattern of Jesus' dying and rising. And then Paul's description of his life here matches this same pattern. So if our life would then follow his model, which follows Jesus' model, it would do the same thing, swooping down into death, and from there then swooping up back into life. It's just a cycle of regular, regular dying and rising. And as we are formed in Christ, then we increasingly realize that this is the normal way of life and it is for our good. That it may actually just be the way of our formation. It's the process by which we become more like Jesus. One professor and scholar, uh, Kyle Strobel, it's up at Biola. He says, we are not merely called to develop habits to form a life. Before Christian maturity is ever transformative, it is first and foremost about death and resurrection. Death and resurrection should never be secluded to conversion. 
even though our conversion is, of course, of course, a death and resurrection with Christ, but as our life is in Christ and his life is our life, death and resurrection are always the pattern of the Christian life depicted throughout the New Testament. And so we're familiar, if you've been walking with Jesus for any length of time, or you've heard or read in the New Testament his calls, we're familiar with his calls to his followers to die to self, right? I mean, it's it's out of vogue in our day, but Jesus said it. We see it in, in John 12. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Whoever loves his life loses it. And whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there will my servant be also. If anyone serves me, the father will honor him. And in Mark's gospel, and he calls the crowd to him with his disciples, and he said to them, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake in the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of him will the son of man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his father with the holy angels and so it is denying our self salvation attempts as if we could ever be good enough to stand blameless before god It's denying this idol factory of a heart that we have and the other gods that we try to worship in our lives. It's denying our flesh and the lesser desires of identity that corrupt what we were actually meant for. But it's not just for when we first come to Jesus. It's for all of life. And we're also acquainted then with other calls in the New Testament to put sin to death in us. Like Paul writing to the church in Colossae said, put to death therefore what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these you too once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put them all away, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. And so we just live out Christian faith in the context of difficult jobs, strained relationships, embarrassing circumstances, right? And shortcomings in our personal and family lives, but all of that dying is meant to be purposeful and will be used to overcome this self-gratification, self-centeredness, and to produce true life in Christ in us. In our familiarity with the dying, we might miss the rising. Because Jesus says of the seed, if it dies, it will bear much fruit. He also said, whoever loses his life for my sake in the gospel will save it. And we carry around the death of Jesus so that his life may be revealed in our body. Paul says, for we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our mortal flesh. It's like, Paul's letter to the Colossians, he says, put on then, after you put off, right, put on then as God's chosen one, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony, and let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you You were called in one body and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do in word and deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. This is a good life. 
This is for our good. His life manifested in our mortal flesh. Kindness, humility, patience, love, the peace of Christ ruling in us. We die to rise. So what does that then look like practically for us? The normal Christian life involves dying continually to comfort, ease, worldly success, cynicism, and despair, and finding true life in repentance, love, humility, and hope. I think of an example in my own life, in my desire, like Dave was praying, like some pastors want to be famous or some, something along those lines. I want to be famous, right? So we were standing by, back the door, and Chris was like, 10 years. Yeah, and, and I was like, this church is far different than I had planned it to be in 10 years. 60 people, it was supposed to be 6,000, right? I was supposed to be on my third best-selling book at this point, right? I think my devotional has sold like 20 copies. It's so good, though. You should, Amazon, check it out. No, I'm just kidding. But I think about, like, my desire for credibility in certain spaces, right? Like, and if I'm interacting with peers on a project with Flourish or City to City, and something is my idea in a meeting, but no one mentions it, that, that it's my idea, right? And then I don't mention that it's my idea. If I'm clinging to my achievement and my reputation as my satisfaction, right, or an idol for me, I would leave that meeting despairing, right? I never checked that box. I never got that affirmation. I never was confident in my expertise. And that would affect my future interaction with all those people. That would affect my view of self. Am I really good enough? Am I, should I even be in this space? But if I die to that desire, if I surrender that slight as I see it to Jesus, when I give that over to him, it then does not control me or drag me down, right? So I can walk into those types of spaces, essentially just asking myself, how am I willing to die to rise in this moment? I think about how it might affect me relationally. And this is one, the example I'm going to use, I wish that I had died too sooner. Right? Thinking of a rejection from a friend that I actually received as betrayal, and I stewed over it. I saw it as an injustice, and it began then to form a victim narrative in my head. And not only in my head, but in my conversation with a lot of folk, some of you. And in doing that, I was missing how God might use it to reveal Christ in my life and in others' lives. But if I put that on the J curve, instead of latching onto a feeling of betrayal, I could have received that just simply as the no that it was, a death, an end. And knowing that life comes from death in Christ, hoping, not stewing, praying, not panicking, it would have solved so many problems. That would have given so much clarity far earlier than it came. And the truth is that dying to those things does not eliminate the emotion. You still feel those things, but it anchors my hope in Christ's steadfastness, not that of my friend. And then his life is revealed. His peace is experienced. I think it's Paul Miller said, our usual response to the relational pain of betrayal, constant criticism, etc., is to push away the story that God has permitted in our lives. That inevitably leads to some form of withdrawal or bitterness, the cancer of the soul. But by receiving the cup that God has permitted in our lives, we neuter the evil. We take the cup offered to us by the Father so the other person no longer captures our soul. And this, I mean, this applies, this posture applies in a thousand, thousands of ways. In dying to feeling dishonored when no one else does the dishes. She's waving. Yeah, I may not die to that. You still have to parent your children. Teach them. Jackie, we have used a, <laughs> this is not in the, main, the notes, but Jackie gave us one of the best parenting lines ever, and we use it in our house often. You are not a victim. 
you and we're adding a sec a second verse to that is you can die to that kid right right or, and maybe it's like dying to that crush of traffic like it takes me an hour to take my kids to school in a little old escondido and quit moving here i know it's cheap man right but i could die to that i'd be like oh thank you lord He's, that's my prayer closet that little minivan amen so it applies in thousands of ways and you know yours like as i'm talking about this you know the thing that the lord is inviting you just to die to just to surrender to him and it is a constant calibration for us to our union with christ realizing that we are in christ and not in the world Think of colossians 2 20 if with christ you died to the elemental spirits of the world why as if you were still alive in the world do you submit to regulations like why would you go back to the struggles of the world when you've died to them Paul Miller, in his book, The J Curve, uses the example of his high school aged daughter being benched by her field hockey coach. And I thought of Audrey, right? She's never been benched because she's the star player. But it, it turns out she, was, she and another friend were benched, likely not for performance, but just because of personality. Like the coach just did not like them. And he talked it over with his daughter, and she decided that she was going to go and talk to the coach. She didn't want her dad to talk to the coach, she wanted to own it, 17 year old wanted to go and own that and talk to the coach. And he thought that was good. Like she should do that. And then uh, another parent heard about it and approached Paul Miller and uh, heard the situation and said, aren't you going to go confront the coach for wronging these girls? Like, felt the injustice of it. He's jeopardizing their stats. It's going to be hard for them to get a scholarship now. And he responded to this other parent, actually, I'm thankful that this happened here because life is a lot like this. And she will learn how to handle this in a safe space. And the other parent was just essentially confounded. And Paul says it's because they were in field hockey, not in Christ. Right, Because field hockey or sport or whatever is their priority, their value, their identity in that moment. And they saw that as controlling everything. And if they're benched in that moment, that would have held on to that slight. That would have monopolized all of life. And we all have stories like that. But in Christ, there's a dying to it. There's a growing in it, saying, okay, Lord, how are you using this? And this doesn't for a second negate justice. We still pursue justice in appropriate ways. We still stand up for what is right. But we experience this cruciform life that the New Testament presents to us. Because Paul does not give six steps to avoid being crushed here. He says we are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake so that his life may be revealed. And this is where the but not crushed, but not in despair, but not abandoned, but not destroyed is experienced. We rise from dying. This is more than a new age emptying of self that leads nowhere. It's not a legalistic subduing of the flesh that develops into either pride or despair. This is a life motivated from something so amazing. Dying and rising is worthwhile because it's rooted somewhere. That's the idea that our lives are anchored to Christ's death and resurrection. So I've got to draw a cross. We're doing stick things here. And, I, and an anchor. This is an anchor, right? That looks like an anchor. I have a big old tattoo of an anchor. Have you guys seen it? Do you want to see it? That's inappropriate. I'll show you later, Phil. Have you, you all know what, it, what I covered with that anchor tattoo? Do you know this story? I died to myself. So I used to have the Republican logo tattooed just above my right butt cheek. And almost 20 years to the same day, covered it with an anchor to remind myself that I had my anchor of my soul are the promises of God. 
that that idolatry is way over. I didn't. You tell him, girl. So our, because that's how anchors are. I'll show you later. Okay. Our lives are anchored to Christ's death and resurrection, right? We wouldn't be wrong if we said that Paul's motivation here for this kind of life was ministry, right? Like he cared for these people. He wanted to win more for the kingdom. But I think that's secondary, right? It is primarily the treasure that is driving him here. Right? He says it, right? We have this treasure in these jars of clay. So then we just go one verse before to see what this treasure is. And he says, For God, who said, Let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So to know the glory of Christ is to encounter the life-transforming glory of God. And this is just the good news of Jesus, of his life, death, and resurrection for you. That in our rejection of God, when we recognize our need, Jesus provides himself in our place to give us his righteousness, to bridge the gap that our sin created. We don't die and rise to gain salvation. We do it because we have salvation in Christ. And when we don't suffer well, when we don't die to things, when we are slow to die and rise, when we cling to the perspectives and priorities of the world system, when we fail, because Jesus died and rose for us, we remain in fellowship with him in his dying and rising. And so that covers us and empowers us to go again, to receive mercy and grace that we might stand again. And for Paul and for us, it is the experience of this glory that drives his love for Jesus that overrides everything. That he can say to the Corinthians who are like, yeah, but these other preachers, they've got Mercedes. They got a cyber truck. Right? Are you th- if you're thinking about it, get pastoral counsel. Those things are ugly. Right? Waste your money on something good looking. Right? But he's saying, like... They may have that that momentary, temporary glory, but they're trying to lead you back to Judaism, but you have been freed from that. And weakness is fine because that's where the power of Christ is realized. And Paul even sets aside all of his accomplishments, his reputation, just for knowing Jesus. We see this in Philippians 3, right? Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also. If anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law of Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings becoming like him in his death that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. This is Jesus' life being revealed in us when we share in his suffering. This is where the strength to rise comes from. And the goal of trusting in Christ is to know him. And that is to know Christ in a personal relationship. And also to know then the power of his resurrection. Namely, the power that Christ exerts now from the right hand of God for us. But this power is made known as the believer shares the same kind of sufferings that Jesus faced. The suffering that attend faithful witness in a fallen world. The good news is that those who suffer with and for Christ will attain the resurrection from the dead, even as he did. And this is where being made like Christ takes on its fullness. Because Jesus' story of dying and rising then defines our story. 
One writer says, theologically, we are being taught an important truth that the death and resurrection of Jesus transpired not only in place of us in a way that we can never follow, but also ahead of us in a way that we must follow. He's not only a substitute, but also a pioneer, blazing a trail we are called to walk ourselves. The former is Christ for us. The latter is Christ in us. Only the former is atoning, but apostolic Christianity necessarily includes both. So we still hurt, we still grieve, we still have permission to, but now our temporary dying isn't just little old me on my own. I am actually caught up into this reenacting of the most magnificent story that has ever been told. Because to believe the gospel necessarily leads to entering into Christ dying and rising. And a life of believing the gospel anchored in Christ's death and resurrection actually becomes like the gospel. Like in comparison, this is babysitting becoming parenting. Business school becoming starting a business. Boot camp actually becoming combat. Falling in love becoming marriage. In each case, we move from knowing about something to actually entering into a deep, personal, experiential knowledge of that thing. From his first encounter on the Damascus Road with Jesus, Paul's life has been this becoming, this knowing, this treasure. And in his dying and rising, Paul does not lose heart as he is anchored to Christ in spite of his suffering as an apostle because the same power that raised Jesus from the dead enables him to endure adversity and reveals the power of God. And this is what is available for us too. This is what has been available to the church for 2,000 years. In our dying and rising, as we are anchored to Christ's finished work for us on the cross and in his resurrection, his victory over death, that we could die to the things of the world, knowing his peace, and live revealing him. And as sure as Christ's cross and resurrection secured salvation and new life for us, our anchor will bring us all the way home. And that's then our lives are tethered to eternal glory. And so, let's make a crown, right? Is that a crown? Let's put some jewels on it, make it shiny. It looks like what? A bear. It's, a, it's a crown. And there's a red thread that ties us to it. You get that? That's glory. And this is the height of the J beyond what we can imagine of the rising. And... Christ's rising was the inbreaking of the life of the new age, the invincible, fully physical, yet immortal glory of final resurrection. And by virtue of our union with him, believers share in this life of the new age even before we have ourselves died. And we will die physically one day. But the new life, resurrection life, will continue on. And one day when Christ returns, we will be given the same kind of bodies that Jesus now has. Here's how Paul says it. So we do not lose heart, though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day, for this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen, for the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. So dying and rising does not seem hard against the scale of eternity. And if the gospel has taught us to look up, to set our mind on things above, we will keep our eyes fixed on what is eternal. And resurrection life with Jesus, the new heavens and earth, the end of dying metaphorically and literally, relational wholeness, experienced righteousness, standing blameless before our Creator. In light and momentary troubles in comparison are dying and rising. They're all just preparing for us an eternal weight of glory. And all of your experience, all your hardship, all the slights, all the persecution, all the violence against you, none of it is meaningless. 
It's working something in us for Jesus' sake, for his glory, for your good, and so that the grace that is reaching more and more people may cause thanksgiving to overflow to the glory of God. And he's bringing you home with him. So friends, following Jesus will lead to a life of dying and rising, and that is for our Good, it is being like Jesus, and we can do that together. We, jars of clay, weak, easily broken. It's fascinating to me that in every archaeological dig across the globe, remnants of jars of clay are always the proof of life. God has made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displays, displayed in the face of Jesus Christ. Friends, treasure Jesus. See Jesus in scripture, in your brothers and sisters. Rest in his finished work for you and ask the Spirit to increase your love for your Savior. And then die and rise with him. Follow him in giving yourself away. Find belonging, value, identity in his claim over you that his life may be revealed in you. And this is, this is so opposite of the prevailing winds of our day. It seems so weak, but it is a life like Jesus and it is good. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. May it be so in us. We pray with me. Good and holy God, we thank you that you have given us life. Life that in your wisdom and sovereignty has determined to shine the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ in our hearts. Lord, by your spirit, would you help us recognize the treasure of that truth? That we would live as is exemplified here, a life of dying and rising, anchored to your finished work, Jesus, tethered to that future hope that we have of eternity with you when dying will be no more. O oh God, our King, by the resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, on the first day of the week, you conquered sin, put death to flight, and gave us hope of everlasting life. Redeem all our days by this victory. Forgive our sins, banish our fears, make us bold to praise you and to do your will, and steal us to wait for the consummation of your kingdom on the last great day. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen and amen.